Good evening. I'm Greg Sadoff, and as the chair of the Colonnade Club's History and Intellectual Programming Committee here at the University of Virginia, and on behalf of the Colonnade Club, I'd like to welcome you here for this virtual presentation this evening. As we approach the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, <clears throat> our university, our country, and the world look back not only on the attacks of 2001, but also bin Laden's death 10 years ago. Peter Bergen has extensively researched Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and will share his insights uh, with us this evening. His just released book, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, not only covers a desperate period in American history, but comes at an extremely desperate time for the many thousands of Afghani refugees who supported American forces during the war in Afghanistan and who are now at the 11th hour being welcomed into our country as their society is increasingly overtaken by the Taliban. Released only days ago, Peter's book has already received powerful reviews for the new insights that he provides based upon documents and materials only recently accessible. Peter Bergen is a journalist, author, documentary producer, and vice president for global studies and fellows at New America, a professor of practice at Arizona State University, a fellow at Fordham University's Center on National Security and CNN's National Security Analyst. He has held teaching positions at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. This is Peter's second appearance at a Colonnade Club event this year. Tonight's program showcases the vital role of journalism in understanding our world and it is therefore only fitting that another journalist, <clears throat> University of Virginia's own McGregor McCants, serve as our moderator and interviewer. For those of you viewing this online, please submit any questions through the Q&A function of the platform, and McGregor will ask as many as possible before he concludes the interview. So now to introduce our interviewer and moderator. McGregor McCants serves as Associate Vice President for Communications in UVA's Office of Communications. His role includes oversight of the UVA Today news site, the Daily Report newsletter, UVA This Month, and the Research Digest. His portfolio includes UVA's central social media platforms, and he also participates in issues management and crisis communications. McGregor joined UVA nine years ago after spending 20 years in the newspaper business in reporting and editing roles at newspapers across Virginia. About six months ago, McGregor conceived the idea of a storytelling project that focused on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and how it affected the lives of people affiliated with the University of Virginia. I can think of no better time to appreciate the perspective of Peter Bergen from the standpoint of best understanding our past in order to prepare for our future. Thank you, McGregor, for all of your preparation and bringing us all here tonight. And I turn this over to you and Peter. Thank you, Dr. Sadoff uh, and Peter. Thank you again for this opportunity to visit with you. It's really an honor. And I just want to thank as well the members of the Colonnade Club and anyone who's joining us uh, through the Zoom link as well. We really appreciate your time and interest in this very, very timely topic. Um, so Peter, your book is very fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed the chance to read it. And I have to tell you, I learned an immense amount about both bin Laden and about America's uh, involvement um, with Al Qaeda and leading up to 9-11 and after that, I was really um, not aware of. And it really has helped me to frame how I see the current events that are happening right now in Afghanistan, seemingly by the minute. And it would be, it'd be pretty easy to spend the entire time just hogging your time and asking you questions, but I do want to follow up Greg's comment and say that we will leave some time at the end to try to um, work in as many audience questions as we can. So um, I guess I'll start, Peter, um, by saying that you say you decided to write this book because you wanted to try to discover what it was that transformed this seemingly um, uh, mild-mannered, privileged, privileged person into a radicalized person who was intent on killing as many people as possible. So first, did you answer that question to your own satisfaction? 
Well, thank you, Dr. Sadoff, and thank you, uh, McGregor and McCants, uh, for this um, the opportunity to, and also the Colonnade Club, thank you for um, having me talk about my new book. Um, you know, Dr. Sadoff is uh, somebody who studies uh, um, people uh, who have, uh, <clears throat> you know, who are engaged in terrorist crimes. Um, that's one of the, his professional roles. And he works with the FBI to do that. And, um, you know, I think that the why question is always uh, quite difficult. Um, I, um, so what I try to do in the book is instead of trying to have a big uh, kind of $64,000 answer to the question why, I actually try to explain how. Uh, because, and, and the reader uh, can leave, she, he or she can sort of, if they read the book, uh, maybe come to their own conclusions about how this happened. I, I think one of the themes of the book is nothing is inevitable uh, in, in Bin Laden's life. And, you know, we know from our own lives that, um, you know, the person that we are at uh, 54 is different from the person we are at 18. And, and the, you know, it's not simply... Um, a question of kind of what character you were born with, but also your life experiences. Bin Laden was killed in Pakistan when he was 54. And I trace the evolution from a shy religious teenager, the son of a multimillionaire or even a billionaire, uh, who really made little impression on anybody except because of the, the only thing they noticed was his extreme religiosity into the leader of a group uh, that was, you know, essentially whose mission it was, was to kill uh, mass numbers of American civilians. Um, and, and that process took decades. And, uh, you know, by Bin Laden's own account, and I, I talk about this in the book, you know, Bin Laden's parents um, were only married for two years. There was only one child from this union. His father, aged about 50, met, met a Syrian teenager uh, when he was already a very wealthy man with many wives, current and former, married this teenager, had a kid with her, the one child, that was Osama bin Laden in 1957. They split off. Bin Laden described the marriage uh, in, the, the, in the book as, as if his mother was almost a concubine, not a real wife, um, because his father had you know, 20 wives at least. Um, and then his father died in a plane crash uh, when bin Laden was 10. Now, obviously, his relationship with his father was uh, you know, it was almost non-existent. Uh, I explain in the book, he only met his father on five occasions. Uh, he only seemed to have one substantive one-on-one -on -one meeting with his father, but he took the death of his father pretty hard, according to his mother and according to himself. And he, um, that turned him in a religious direction. Um, he started studying the Quran. As a teenager, he, uh, you know, he became very religiously devout. He was praying instead of five times a day, he'd add an extra set of prayers in the middle of the night. He would be fasting twice a week. His idea of fun with his friends was to chant religious chants about Palestine when he invited them over to his house. So not a typical teenager, but still that's a long way from, you know, the founder of Al Qaeda. So the book uh, kind of takes you, takes the reader through a journey uh, to explain, you know, how he, 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 you know, how he became the leader of this group. And it wasn't inevitable for a number of reasons. And I think one of those was because um, it, he didn't necessarily start out to, uh, to be where he ended up. But also, there were many, many opportunities, as you report in the book, which he could have been in a, sent in another direction, not become the leader that he became, or, of course, killed numerous times by various factions or the United States. Yeah, and I mean, some of his friends, various friends tried to intervene and also family members along the way. Um, yeah, there was off ramps he could have taken. In fact, at one point, he even uh, really was, I think, seriously considering a big off ramp. Jamal Khashoggi, who uh, everybody on this uh, call, I'm sure will, will recall, was a Washington Post columnist who was murdered in Istanbul in 2018 by Saudi operatives. Well, Jamal was, uh, you know, kind of a, a as a young Saudi journalist working for the mainstream Saudi press, uh, did the first big profile of Osama bin Laden when he was fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. That profile, which appeared both in Arabic and English in the Saudi press, kind of turned bin Laden into something of a household name in Saudi Arabia in 1988. Five years later, Jamal Khashoggi went to Sudan, where bin Laden was living in exile, and had a conversation with him in which bin Laden expressed a fair amount of uh, nostalgia for the Holy Land of Saudi Arabia, 
said that he wasn't really enjoying Sudan. And over the course of three days, Jamal Khashoggi suggested to bin Laden, why don't you do an interview with me in which you renounce violence? Um, and you know that will be your ticket home, essentially. Um, and the interview never happened. Uh, but bin Laden seemed interested in maybe a rapprochement with the Saudis. And that was not the only time when he had, you know, an off-ramp was presented to him. Uh, his mother and his uh, uncle, who was a very important figure in the family, uh, came to speak to him and try to persuade him to, you know, kind of reconcile with the Saudi royal family, uh, both when he was living in Sudan and living in Afghanistan. But even before then, you know, his friend, one of his closest friends, Jamal Khalifa, who was his brother-in-law as well, came to visit him when he was fighting the Soviets and told him, look, setting up a, your own Saudi military force makes no sense at all, which is what bin Laden was doing, because essentially you have no military experience and you're going to get a lot of young Saudi men who are you know, volunteering to fight with you are going to get them killed. That was very good advice, which bin Laden didn't follow. So one of the kind of takeaways from the book, I think, is that bin Laden, you know, he just has a, he had a, a, he was a true believer. You know, he truly believed in his own mission. He believed it was a mission from God and he wasn't going to be deflected from it. The second part of, of that question. Uh, so if that was your intent in writing the book, why is pursuing that kind of answer important to us today? What can we take from it? I mean, I mean, I studied history at university and um, I mean, why do we study history at all? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, <laughs> we study history not, I mean, Mark Twain, I think, had the best observation, a famous one, which is, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly can rhyme. Right. And I think, you know, if we don't understand our own history, we're just wandering around in a, in a kind of meaningless present. Um, and I think the study of history, of, of any history, is useful because um, human nature, in a sense, is relatively stable. Uh, evil uh, will happen. Uh, you know, bad things will happen. Um, having an understanding of, you know, I do not believe myself in a sort of the, the Whig view of history or the kind of optimistic view of history that everything is just tending towards some brighter future. I mean, certainly there are periods of history when that's true, uh, but there are plenty, you know, Weimar Germany was probably one of the more enlightened democratic uh, European uh, polities in the 20s, and, uh, and yet it produced Adolf Hitler. And of course, Bin Laden is not Adolf Hitler or anything close, but if, we, if you don't understand just our own 20th century history, um, you know, you're, it's, it's hard to, it's almost hard to function as a human being, I, I think, if, if we don't understand not only our own histories, but the histories of, of the 20th century. Well, the history of bin Laden and Al-Qaeda um, and our ongoing uh, efforts in the war on terror, Afghanistan, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you have followed so closely for, for decades now. Um, but you mentioned to me previously that there were things that you found in, in your investigation into this book that surprised even, even you. What are some of those things? Well, yeah, you know, the Trump administration, bin Laden had five and a half years living in Abbottabad, and he generated a tremendous amount of, uh, he was a you know, prolific writer of memos and letters and, and all those materials. Uh, he never expected to be you know, to fall into enemy hands. Yeah. And they're really a, a kind of, um, a, a, you can see what he's thinking because he was communicating with family members. He was communicating with people in Al Qaeda he really trusted, and these were his real, his real, real thoughts. And so, those materials were only released in full in late 2017 by the Trump by the Trump administration. They had been released in tranches, also by the Obama administration. But one of the uh, key documents in the last tranche released by the the Trump administration, there are 470,000 files. Hmm. M many of those files are just, uh, you know, like cartoons his kids were watching or newspapers that people were, uh, articles that people were kind of, he was, his bodyguards would pick up and bring to him and books hmm. that he was interested in reading on PDF. But so a lot of the material just isn't that germane, but there are 6,000 pages or so that are quite germane. Um, and one of the key documents is a 228-page Bin Laden family journal. Now, the CIA, when it released uh, this document, said it was Bin Laden's journal. Um, in some ways, it's even more interesting. It's the Bin Laden family journal because Bin Laden um, had just been reunited with his oldest wife. He was 54. She was 62. She had a PhD in child psychology. She'd had an independent career before she met Bin Laden as a child psychologist. 
um, and she had a tremendous knowledge of the Quran. She was a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and bin Laden really looked to her for kind of strategic advice and thoughts and help with his speeches. He also had another wife with a PhD in Quranic grammar, grammar exactly his own age. Um, and he also relied on her for kind of, you know, how to think through problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, the bin Laden family journal recounted these almost nightly meet meetings in the final weeks of bin Laden's life, where his oldest wives, his two adult daughters and his adult son would puzzle through what should bin Laden say about the Arab Spring, because the Arab Spring by bin Laden's own account to people in Al Qaeda was the most important event in the Middle East in centuries. And yet he well understood that his, you know, no one was holding up banners of Osama bin Laden in the early days of these revolutions in Tunisia and Libya and in Egypt, uh, and he wanted to intervene and he wanted to come out with a big speech that would position himself as, as a leader of the Arab Spring. Now, this was a total delusion because the liberals who were mounting the barricades in Cairo or the Muslim Brotherhood uh, you know, leaders who were also in parts of these revolutions uh, were not interested in Al-Qaeda and its ideas. The Muslim Brotherhood, of course, engages in conventional politics, which Al-Qaeda rejects. And of course, they also reject um, you know, liberal ideas. So. So bin Laden, you know, every night would have these sessions with his family. The family really regarded him as a world historical figure and they truly believed that he, if he delivered the right speech, that he could take control of the Arab Spring. He never delivered that speech. He did record a short videotape that was released um, two weeks after his death by Al-Qaeda. And it was a pretty bland kind of tape, just saying, this is a big event. And, you know, he his bin Laden's big idea was that a, a religious council should advise the new governments in the Arab world. And of course, that religious council would look like the Taliban. And uh, it was not an idea that would have, um, you know, been terribly exciting to the people involved in the Arab Spring protests. But cool. uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just I was going to take a, a small detour into the process of obtaining and reviewing that level of, of documentation when it becomes available. I mean, as a as a former reporter, it's kind of it's ex it's exhilarating, but also intimidating to think that you suddenly have access to thousands and thousands of pages of documents that that could be very revealing. How did you go through that? How did you get it? And and what did you think when you started going through it? Well, anybody who's interested, the the Office of Director of National Intelligence has released these documents, um, and um, you know, some of them are in English, and most of them remain in Arabic. So you know. I, you know, I've been reporting on Bin Laden for two and a half decades, so and I'm also a pack rat, like um, like a lot of uh, reporters, um, and I keep all the documents that are useful. Um, and I love documents, uh, particularly documents that, um, you know, um, weren't meant for public release, mm -hmm. uh, because, um, you know, documents tend not to lie, uh, particularly ones that um, weren't intended for public release. And so um, I think, the, you know, obviously they're not, they don't explain everything, uh, but I think they can explain a lot. And so, you know, I've been thinking about doing this book for a long time. And um, the 20, you know, one of the, I teach at Arizona State University and one of my students asked me, she wasn't born on 9-11, I don't think, what's the difference between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? I thought, well, hey, that's a pretty interesting question. <laughs> um, and so and I realized that she and everybody I was teaching in this undergraduate class at Arizona State were either babies or not even born on 9-11. Um, right. And for them, 9-11 was as distant of an event as the, you know, as the end of the Korean War was, was for me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a child, uh, something I knew almost nothing about. Now, obviously, 9-11, as you point out, McGregor, was obviously, you know, it has had greater effects, in a sense, on the body politic and the politics of America and our foreign policy and continues to do so to some degree in a way that isn't so true of the Korean War. So, but nonetheless, you know, people who are volunteering to join the US military today uh, may not have been born on 9-11. Uh, and, and the 20th anniversary is a good time to look back. It's also the 10th anniversary of bin Laden's death. Um, and, and it's, I think, I thought it was time to do a reassessment of bin Laden in all his different roles as a terrorist leader, as a fugitive, uh, as a, you know, his role as a leader of his family uh, his, you know, he, just, you know, it, to try and explain more, it wasn't, and when I say explain, there's a, you know, there's a French phrase, to comprendre, say, to pardon, you know, to, if you understand everything, you forgive everything. Um, you know, I, I, that, that was not my intent with this. 
Um, but I, <clears throat> you know, Hitler was nice to his dog and somewhat nice to Eva Braun, his girlfriend. Uh, that doesn't mean that he was a good guy. And so, but I mean, yeah. it's also to sort of pretend that Hitler wasn't a man or that bin Laden didn't have, you know, this extensive family. He had 24 children and five wives, one of whom he divorced or one of whom divorced him. That's all part of the bin Laden story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in terms of kind of what one of the surprises in the book is, is the extent to which these two older wives, his oldest wives, both of whom had PhDs, were really kind of involved in helping him think through, uh, you know, his speeches and how he was going to approach things. Um, and, um, yeah. And also just the, um, the, the, the documents from the about about comp compound don't stand alone. Right. Because the U.S. government has continued to pick up documents on the battlefield. Some of them are at West Point. There's also Bin Laden's uh, own statements and the statements of people in Ayman al -Zawari. There's a very useful set of uh, memoirs, not only on the U.S. side, and of course, there's the oral histories at UVA, which are, right. unfortunately don't get the Obama administration, but do get up to the, the Bill Clinton and but George you, W. Bush. You conducted hundreds of interviews for this book as well. Yeah, yeah. But... The memoirs of kind of uh, U.S. government officials uh, that keep coming out were very useful. And then memoirs of people in that are part of bin Laden's circle. Uh, a number of those guys uh, released their own memoirs, some, are, some of which is in Arabic and some of which, well, almost all of which is in Arabic, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, that these are all very useful, you know, primary documents. Um, there was an exceptionally useful history of the Afghan Arabs, as they're called, the who Bin Laden was one of their leaders during the war against the Soviets that was published in 1991 that um, is, is available um, and is a kind of, I think a pretty accurate account of what Bin Laden was doing in the eighties along with the people around him because the, it's, a, it's not a hagiographic account uh, but it's based on, um, no one knew in 1991 that Bin Laden was gonna become the man he was and so, he was, you know, uh, certainly involved in the anti-Soviet war effort. He fought somewhat heroically, but he also, and, and out of that grew, of course, Al Qaeda, which means the base in Arabic. Uh, but Bin Laden's always been not a particularly deep um, military strategist, and uh, one of the themes in the book is the extent to which he kept making military mistakes, culminating in 9/11, which totally backfired. It was a tactical success, but I think a strategic failure for for Al Qaeda. I want to I want to ask you to put your uh, CNN security analyst hat on for a second. Although all your hats are interchangeable, I understand. But um, it, it's been remarkable in the last two weeks or or last month or so to see the condition in Afghanistan change so rapidly. Um, capital cities, uh, provinces being overrun by the Taliban, the U.S. presence coming to a conclusion. Uh, it seems to be heading for total disarray. And I just want to ask you, uh, as someone who's followed it so closely, is any of this surprising you at all? No, unfortunately. I mean, I've, unfortunately, I've written thousands of words predicting exactly what is, what, you know, for CNN yeah. about this, about what I think is, you know, the biggest unforced error of, uh, really the only serious unforced error of the Biden presidency. I mean, this is, this was completely predictable. Uh, it's actually going much worse than even uh, the most uh, sky is falling kind of view that one might have had. Six provincial capitals out of 34 have been taken by the Taliban. Two, 200 of the 400 or so districts are now in Taliban hands. Kunduz, which is a major city in northern Afghanistan, is has, has fallen. And, you know, the, the traditional strength of the Taliban is in the south and the east of the country. The fact that they've taken over most of the north shows some pretty good strategic uh, thinking on their part because their aim is to kind of close in on key cities like Mazar Sharif in the north and then Kabul. Uh, they're in Kandahar fighting. Um, you know, it's a total disaster. And yeah, the split screen on 9 11, the anniversary will be the names of the dead being read at the World Trade Center Memorial and the Taliban, uh, you know, declaring their, their victory. And I've, you've already seen pictures of the Taliban rolling into cities on American Humvees. I mean, these, these pictures speak a thousand words. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what's so puzzling is, you know, President Joe Biden, then Vice President Joe Biden, and Secretary of State Tony Blinken, Tony Blinken who was then 
uh, the deputy national security advisor were, yeah, you know, they were the people who negotiated our pullout from Iraq in December of 2011. Three years later, ISIS was at the gates of Baghdad, and you know we had the Obama administration had a reverse policy and send thousands of American troops back in, start training up the Iraqi counterterrorism service, um, and the you know the campaign against ISIS took another four years to complete. Uh, two of which, two years of which were under you know, the, the, the Trump administration. So, you know, uh, history, I go to going back to Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And we've, I'm looking at the Taliban advances and I'm seeing some very similar kind of themes that we saw with the ISIS advances. One is the collapse of the Afghan National Army, which isn't fighting at all. Two, um, you know, ISIS, when it, what, uh, ISIS was uh, to a large degree made up of uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and, and the various iterations of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and many of those have been former prisoners in Iraqi prisoners, prisons, and we're seeing the Taliban going into places and releasing a lot of Taliban prisoners who are joining the battle. Part of our disastrous peace negotiations with the Taliban, which was a misnomer, it was a withdrawal negotiation, was getting the Afghan government to release 5,000 members of the Taliban, many of whom joined the Taliban. The whole thing was crazy. Our peace negotiations will go down on history as one of the kind of most unsuccessful uh, diplomatic efforts we have engaged in because uh, the Taliban won on the one at the negotiating table what they never got at the, on the battlefield, which mm -hmm. was us to, to, to pull out. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, um, looking forward then, based on what you've seen happen very rapidly and what you've seen happen in the past, what's what's the worst case scenario for what happens next in Afghanistan? And then how does that relate to and affect us here in the United States? Well, the best case scenario is it's, you know, we're thrown into an incredibly nasty civil war, which makes the present conflict look like a croquet match. And it look, I was there during the, I, I first visited Afghanistan in 93. The civil war in Afghanistan in 93 was a real civil war. It was not 3,000, I mean, it, it's bad now, but it was infinitely worse then. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Afghans destroyed the, you know, the capital of Kabul, it was like Mogadishu in 93, it was block to block fighting. There were multiple ethnic militias uh, fighting each other. Um, it, and that, you know, this is what we're going to see because you've, you've, got, you've got the Taliban, which is estimates of up to 60,000 fighters. You've got the Afghan National Army, uh, Afghan, which is kind of incompetent. You, and then you have the Afghan Special Forces, which is smaller and quite competent. And then you have these Tajik militias, one of which is going to be led by Ahmed Shah Massoud's son, who's called Ahmed Massoud, who was the leader of the anti-Taliban alliance during the, the civil war that produced the Taliban. You have Uzbek militias. You have uh, a guy called Ismail Khan in Herat, who's been around as an Afghan warlord since the fight against the Soviets. All these guys have been arming for a long time. And a lot of them are, these mili tribal militias are going to be very effective. They're fighting for their home territory. So I think the best case scenario is an incredibly nasty civil war mm -hmm. in which the Taliban is sort of the dominant player, but you can't take over the country entirely. And that's the best case scenario. That's the best case scenario. The worst case is the Taliban simply takes over and every jihadi group in the world pours in because, you know, essentially it's the, the, the differences between the Taliban and the other, other jihadi groups are far less significant than the similarities. Um, and, you know, Afghanistan becomes, you know, jihadi terrorism central as it was before 9-11. Uh, and that's, you know, so, you know, not, and what, none, none of this was unpredictable because yeah. we've seen this yeah. movie before. And, um, you know, I mentioned in the book, we, we, clo we closed our embassy, we the United States in 1989 after the Soviets withdrew. And that turned out to be a very expensive mistake, I think, because as soon as you close your embassy, you know, you essentially, and particularly in a sort of pre-internet age or, um, you know, it, uh, I mean, you're, you, you don't have eyes and ears on the ground, even today. I mean, you just, you, you, you absent yourself. And, and so the Taliban arose and we didn't really understand the Taliban initially. And then Al Qaeda came in. We had, you know, very little leverage there because we kind of abandoned the country. We only went in after 9-11. Well, um, go ahead. Uh, this is this is a really naive question, I understand, but your book does talk about how much um, Al Qaeda, Bin Laden himself, feared American drones, uh, yeah. and this combination, which seems to be a relatively simple combination of drones and intelligence and small special forces attacking, seemed to have a dramatic effect on 
the United States ability to exert influence there. Um, and so it looks like we're not going to be doing any of that now. Um, is that a mistake? I mean, well, I think it's a little unclear what U.S. policy is. We we can we have continued to conduct airstrikes. They they may stop on August thirty first uh, when the final U.S. combat troops leave. It's not clear. I mean, I, and of course, the Biden administration isn't entirely can change its mind. But you know, the fact is, is that we'll be um, you know whatever operations will be conducted, we'll be conducting from Qatar. There's a big U.S. base there, as you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, or, or the United Arab Emirates or. Or, or in ships in the Arabian Sea or whatever. I mean, so we're gonna have, you know, a very limited view, understanding of what's going on. The embassy will still be open, uh, but, you know, embassies are beginning to close. Uh, the Australian embassy uh, closed. And one of the worst things I think about this decision is we sort of announced that we're leaving you know, pretty much unilaterally. Um, didn't involve the Afghan government in any meaningful way with this, this decision. Um, when we left, the 7,000 allied NATO soldiers also decided to leave, even though there were 7,000 of them, there were only 2,500 Americans. Um, and then 16,000 contractors, almost all of them are leaving. So, I mean, the whole, the whole edifice is just sort of being abruptly pulled out. And I, I think that uh, whatever your views about our pre continued presence in Afghanistan or winding down our presence, the way we did this just by just, you know, there was very almost no thought given to it, um, and it seems it was a kind of it's kind of almost a knee-jerk decision. And our presidents is different. You know, President Obama thought about doing this. And he had serious discussions in 2015, 2016 about whether to pull out. In the end, he decided to leave 8,400 troops. And obviously, President Trump was always talking about leaving. In the end, he um, he also left a, a, a contingent. Um, and President Biden has, has followed through with going to zero. But, you know, we have a, a, a HR McMaster often talks about American strategic narcissism, which is we, we tend to have the belief that if we're not involved in the conflict, the conflict is over. If there's been any number of headlines recently saying, you know, US pulls out Afghan war over. Well, actually the Afghan war is accelerating. It's not de-accelerating as a result of, our, and you know, the absence of American boots on the ground doesn't equal peace. I think people both on the left and the right have got this seriously confused. And, and go ahead. Well, uh, I, want, I wanted to, uh, with our time, it's around seven now, I wanted to jump back into specific contents from the book, particularly because of the, uh, the audience we have here with the Colonnade Club and those affiliated with UVA. Um, I want to talk for a minute about Gina Bennett and learn more about her uh, and her role and influence on your book. She appears first on page 100 or so. And, and I thought it was pretty neat to see that um, a University of Virginia graduate was showing up as a person who played an early and I, I would assume underappreciated if not ignored role in identifying the threat of bin Laden well before um, he became established and well before 9-11. Um, Bennett, by the way, graduated I think in 88 or 89 from UVA with a foreign affairs uh, degree. And she worked for the State Department as a clerk typist until a supervisor of hers moved her into a, a role in which she could really grow and expand. How did you meet her? Tell us about uh, what her role is in this book. Yeah, I mean, I've known Gina for a long time and um, I'm a big admirer of hers. Uh, you know, as you, she, she was the first official in the US government to write a, a memo about bin Laden and the threat he posed. Um, as you say, she left UVA in 90, 1988. A week later, she was at the State Department. Uh, she got promoted to the Intelligence uh, uh, Bureau at the State Department, known as INR. Um, and it's, it's one of the smallest intelligence agencies in the American government. Um, she got it, it was the Cold War was ending, and she understood that this, the, there was this group of Afghan Arabs led by bin Laden who were showing up in conflicts and around the, the, the Middle East, and she got very interested. They were appearing in Bosnia and Algeria, even in places like Burma, um, in Egypt, uh, and they were leading armed groups. And so she started investigating. And then in late February, 1993, um, some of these Afghan Arabs bombed the Trade Center um, and tried to, you, you may recall, they drove a van into the basement. They tried to bring down the Trade Center. Um, and at the time she was in hospital, had just delivering her first son, and she got called by her supervisor and said, you know, her, her supervisor said, your people did this. 
and she was kind of confused because you know, she was uh, in the hospital with her with her newborn son, and then she understood what she what the supervisor was referring to the Afghan Arabs that she'd been tracking. And so she wrote when she returned from maternity leave, she wrote the first memo warning about Bin Laden. It was it was classified at the time. Now it's publicly released, and um, it was a you know very interesting document. She really, uh, then wrote another document very quickly thereafter, which for the first time mentioned Al Qaeda. She was one of the literally a handful of people within the U.S. government that um, were focused on this issue, and she set up an interagency working group of people who shared her views in 1995. Uh, in 1996, when Bin Laden went from Sudan to Afghanistan, she warned in another classified memo that um, Bin Laden in Afghanistan actually would be much more problematic potentially than he was in Sudan, as he was, you know, he had a, this whole network of people in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan that he knew. This was in his own mind, the place that he defeated one superpower and he, he was gonna set up his organization to try and you know, come back and try and defeat another superpower, the United States. So Gina still works at the CIA. She's um, attached to the National Counterterrorism Center today. Um, and um, you know, somebody that I think that I, I very much admire and who um, understood the threat from Bin Laden early on has continued to kind of be, her whole career has been about combating jihadist terrorists. When Pan Am 103 blew up uh, back in, uh, when she just started at the State Department, you know, on that plane, there were 35 students from Syracuse University. And this really had an impact on her because she was at the State Department working for consular affairs, working with bereaved families. And here were these students, not much younger than her, who'd been killed on Pan, Pan Am 103. And so she's really made it her life's mission mm. to kind of oh. combat uh, jihadists and other, and other terrorists. She appears throughout the book. Um, I found interesting that her name kept popping up, um, as well as other people who were, you know, in various roles and positions, uh, but who were kind of sounding an alarm of sorts about bin Laden, about uh, Al Qaeda, about the threats um, leading up to 9-11, to of course. Um, and a lot of those uh, warnings apparently were uh, ignored, probably not the right word, Peter. I don't know what the right word is, uh, but I'm sure there was lots of intelligence that was being circulated at the time. At any event, um, there were people warning about things for a long time that the U.S. government did not either take seriously or, or act upon. And that felt like just sort of a, a theme throughout the book um, that you were trying to bring forward as sort of a cautionary tale. Is that a fair interpretation? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't trying to make it a cautionary tale so much as just saying, here's what actually happened. I mean, the CIA, what is the CIA's job? It is to provide strategic warning to policymakers. That's what its real job is. Over nine, after 9-11, it kind of evolved into a paramilitary organization that was killing a lot of people with drone attacks, which were quite effective as bin Laden himself. We know from the documents in Abbottabad, he was very concerned about the drone program. But but CIA um, did a very good job of strategic warming of this in the spring and summer of 2001. It was not absorbed by the, by the Bush administration. Senior policy officials just didn't, you know, if, if you don't think something is really an issue, you even if you're warned about it, you just, you kind of just tune it out. We also uh, write that they were fixated on that rack at the time as well, right? The rack and, you know, you know, from their mind, big guys, you know, weren't concerned with this small guy in Afghanistan, they were concerned with Saddam Hussein or Russia or China or whatever. Now, CIA did make a big mistake, serious error, which was they didn't communicate to the FBI that they knew two members of Al-Qaeda were in the United States in the run-up to 9-11. And this information was known to 50 or 60 CIA employees who didn't pass on the information to the FBI, I think, uh, until August the 25th, 2001. So, and these guys were living in San Diego. They were living there under their true names. So I think one of them had, they were even in the, phone, in the phone book. So they would not have been difficult to find. And they were two of the hijackers that flew the plane into the Pentagon. So yeah, that was a serious error. But on the, on the flip side, you know, they did provide strategic warning to policymakers and policymakers just tuned it out. Uh, they just didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't absorb these warnings at all. Um, and is there a cautionary tale? Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, but I didn't intend to write it as a cautionary tale. I just try to tell the history that it, you know that we that we know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, unfortunately, that's the history that that actually happened. Well, I'm curious. I'm curious to hear how your response to this question because I've seen it asked in many, many media reports of many people. But um, you know, since 9/11 and the U.S.'s reaction as 
as government, policy, military, et cetera. Um, there, have been a, there have been numerous attempts on a smaller scale and some small successes, but nothing on the scale of 9-11, which really bin Laden wanted to do again. Um, and so I guess the question is, you know, do you consider that a victory of sorts that, uh, that we have not suffered another um, attack of that magnitude or even close to it? I do. And I, I think there are sort of three big reasons for that. One is our offensive capabilities, the best witness for the effectiveness of the drones are uh, bin Laden's own memos from Abbottabad. He was very concerned about the drone program, which was killing his entire middle management um, and killed one of his sons. And, um, uh, <clears throat> and um, he was thinking of moving Al-Qaeda from the Afghan-Pakistan border, where it was mostly located, deeper into Pakistan or even back into Afghanistan. So, and, you know, on 9-11, there were 16 people on the no, on, on the no-fly list. Now there are, you know, last time I checked, 84,000. There are a million and a half on the larger list called Tide, which would means you go into secondary screening if you get on an American plane or a US-bound flight. So, I mean, first of all, we have the offensive capabilities. You mentioned drones and also US special operations, both of which have been pretty effective, and special forces, which of course advise and assist local, um, local forces. Look at the Iraqi case of the, I think one of the great, Adv advise and assist missions of uh, that is doesn't get enough attention is what we did with the Iraqi counterterrorism service after the rise of ISIS. I mean, this is a highly effective group uh, that was you know kind of built on American advise and assist oper uh, operation. Um, so there's, there's our offensive capabilities and then defensive. I mean, you know, the intelligence bu budget tripled between 9-11 and today, we, you know, we, we have an alphabet soup of agencies that didn't exist before, TSA, DHS, NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center where Gina Bennett works now. Um, and all that makes us a much harder target. And there's only one attack that could be in any way linked to a foreign terrorist organization after 9-11. Uh, and that was the attack in Pensacola in 2019 where three American sailors were killed by a Saudi military officer Interestingly, Trump's, uh, the Trump administration's travel ban, of course, wasn't directed at Saudis. And it was a, the only foreign national who's actually carried out a lethal attack since 9-11 on American soil was a Saudi, just like the 15 Saudis who were um, made up of you know, uh, the bulk of the 19 hijackers. So I think, A, that underlined that um, the, the weakness of these foreign terrorist organizations, uh, the, the way we've disrupted them, our defensive capabilities, and B, it underlines, you know, just how, why the travel ban was a, a solution to a problem that didn't exist because it was directed in the wrong place. It made no sense. And, and most of the lethal, all the lethal terrorist attacks in not, since 9-11 have actually been carried out with the exception of Pensacola by American citizens or legal permanent residents. And it's because, the, our offensive, uh, our, our, because of our offensive and defensive capabilities, the only people capable of mounting these attacks are people who are already in the United States. They're not people coming from outside. Um, and not, some of them are not only, in, you know, and many of them are American citizens, and that's a much harder target, obviously, um, you know, for to people. And they, they're radicalizing on the internet, and they're not part of a group. And um, look at Omar Mateen, who killed 49 people at a nightclub in Orlando in 2016. You know, he grew up in Queens, New York. He's an American citizen. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was a lone actor. Um, and that we've kind of, that's the problem that exists, but it's a very different problem in both scale and nature than what happened on 9-11. Absolutely, but to circle back to what's happening in Afghanistan today, I mean, are, are we less safe as a result of what's going, there, going on there at the moment? I mean, let's find, I mean, we will, we will see. I mean, I, I, I can't make that sure. statement today, but I can, you know, two or three years down the road. I mean, it took ISIS, Think about the attack in Paris in 2015 that killed 130 people, including a number of American citizens attending, attending a rock concert. Um, you know, it took them at least a year to get organized to train all these guys up to do the attack. So I mean, you, these things don't happen immediately. Uh, but if the Taliban take over much of the country, every jihadi group in the world either is already there or comes in there mm -hmm. to get training. Um, you know, uh, two two years down the road, you have a you have a group of people who can carry out attacks in the West. Can they attack the United States? That's probably harder because we, you know, we, we Europe is just an easier target uh, for in terms of distance. But um, we, you know, we were lucky to 
when Northwest Flight 253 flew over Detroit on this Christmas day, 2009, the, you know, the Al Qaeda recruit on board wanted to bring down that jet with a, with a, you know, a, an underwear bomb, uh, luckily it malfunctioned. So, but he, he was trained in Yemen. So, I mean, we, in these ungoverned spaces with jihadi terrorist groups, you know, that allows them to train people and, and we just know how that ends. Right. Well, uh, so it's 7.15 and I want to um, leave some time here in, in case there are questions from, from the viewers. But before I do that, Peter, um, thanks again for, for the wonderful book and for taking the time to speak with, uh, with me and us. Um, and I just wanted to kind of leave you a, uh, uh, an open-ended question of sorts, and that is, is there anything else about the book that you'd like to share with this audience that we really haven't touched on in, in any way? If I've whiffed on any major question, please go ahead and, and address that. Yeah, I mean, one, I think there was a kind of debate um, about how, the role of religion in all this. Um, and I think if you, I don't hit this point over the head of the reader, but you know, you can't explain Bin Laden without religion. It would be like explaining the Crusades without reference to Christianity. And his religious beliefs, of course, are, you know, very, very minority view. Uh, in 1.5 billion Muslims um, almost entirely do not share these views, but it, to pretend that they're not somehow linked in some way to Islam, I think is simply not true. Um, I mean, when Bin Laden, so Bin Laden cites quite a lot of religious verses, obviously it's cherry picking them from the Quran. They, these are not from the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad um, in order to justify his holy war. And you know, only a tiny minority of, of jihadist um, true believers kind of uh, accept uh, this view. But um, I think Bin Laden, you can't explain Bin Laden without reference to his religious beliefs. He really believed that God was on his side. Um, he believed that if he didn't do what he was doing, that God would punish him. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, we live in a, an increasingly secularized world. Um, and I think it's easy to underestimate the role of religious belief uh, in someone like Bin Laden. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me take a quick peek here at a couple of these questions, Peter. Um, uh, so this is addressed in your book. Um, if bin Laden had produced a nuclear weapon of some kind that he could have delivered, do you think he would have used it? You know, one of the interesting things about bin Laden is he was kind of a dove uh, on this issue of weapons of mass destruction. Some of the documents we, that were recovered in the Badabad, he told Al Qaeda in Iraq, don't use chemical weapons. He told Yemen, the Al Qaeda in Yemen, don't use chemical weapons. He wasn't concerned on a moral uh, basis he was concerned on a reputational basis um, and so there were other people in al-qaeda like him and Azwari, who claimed that al-qaeda had nuclear weapons they would have had no compunction using them if they had access to them but the you know i did i've done a lot of reporting on the question of al-qaeda and its sort of weapons of mass destruction program and essentially it was an extremely amateur effort you may recall mcgregor pictures of a dog being gassed that the cnn uh, found these videos um, shortly after 9-11. Well, you know, gassing a dog with a chemical weapon is quite different than <laughs> assembling a nuclear weapon. And Bin Laden did meet with nuclear people from the Pakistani nuclear program and talked about nuclear weaponry and Al-Qaeda did acquire fissile, what they thought was fissile material, but turned out only to be, you know, radioactive material from like medical waste. So they had a very naive view about this. And if you fast forward to ISIS, ISIS took over Mosul and inside the Mosul University Laboratory, according to reporting by Joby Warwick of the Washington Post, there was cobalt uh, 60, which would have been a perfect uh, uh, way to build a radioactive weapon, a, 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 you know, a, a radiological weapon. And they didn't know what they had and they never did it. And I'm sure they would have tried if they'd known, but so there's a kind of combination of uh, not having real access to uh, weaponized uh, materials that could be weaponized, uh, despite trying to buy weaponized anthrax, they never succeeded. Um, they, Al Sunni ISIS, Al Qaeda in Iraq, used uh, chlorine in their in their bombs. The chlorine, it, um, if you if you if a chlorine bomb went off in my bedroom right now, I would be killed by the blast, not by the chlorine. It, it's not a particularly effective 
So that's all a long way of saying, yeah, it, yeah, they they may they may well have used these weapons, uh, but they Bin Laden himself was concerned about reputational risk, and he was worried about Muslims thinking that you know that this would be a bad thing. He wasn't worried about any kind of moral issue, and beyond all that, they simply just didn't have the capacity or the ability or the right people to build these weapons, which are, by the way, not that easy to build. Right. Um, another question about um, the effect of trauma, um, with the understanding that trauma is an emotional event that can affect decision making. Were there any traumas, uh, whether at Tora Bora or elsewhere, that appeared to have affected bin Laden and his ability to lead? Uh, did he appear to exhibit anxiety or depression as a result of his experiences that may have affected his decision making in any way? I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I, I think that this this kind of view that God is on my side kind of informed, you know, when Bin Laden escaped from Tara Bara, he did it on the 27th day of Ramadan. So, they, you know, in Bin Laden's own view, he was kind of replicating the Prophet Muhammad. You know, he would sleep in the same way the Prophet Muhammad had. He married three women, all of whom claimed descent from the Prophet Muhammad. He um, referred to, um, he, he was very conscious of, his actions in his own view replicating the prophet muhammad the 27th of the day of ramadan is the most sacred day in the muslim calendar um, it's the day that um the heavens open um, and the prophet took his night ride from the, the alaska mosque in jerusalem and that was the very night that bin laden escaped from Tara Bara. so in his own mind you know even in a defeat you know his he lost there were seven hundred thousand pounds of american bombs dropped on Tara Bara. He certainly lost a lot of people, but he escaped. And I'm sure in his own mind, this was a sign of God's favor. So I don't think he suffered from conventional trauma or conventional anxiety because he just saw himself as an instrument of God's will. Um, this goes back to something we talked about a little bit with, with Gina Bennett um, and the Americans' failures to act on intelligence that they had. Why, why did the U.S. not take CIA intelligence seriously about the rise of bin Laden two decades before 9-11, or at least apparently not do anything actionable with the intelligence that was provided them? Yeah, well, good question. I mean, there were numerous opportunities to kill bin Laden or capture him. Um, there was a big disconnect between what the White House had ordered in a in a memorandum of notification that remains classified and what the CIA believed this authorization said. Mm -hmm. And it was an ambiguity. The ambiguity was CIA heard that the Clinton White House had authorized a, a kill operation on bin Laden only in the context of a genuine capture operation that failed. Um, and that was pretty hard to manage in a place where there was no US embassy, you're relying on Afghan tribals, uh, units, uh, you know, uh, there were a number of opportunities, uh, you know, to potentially capture kill bin Laden. They, mm -hmm. Usually the intelligence was regarded as not sufficiently strong or, and it, or there was collateral damage and the, the operations were called off. Uh, cruise missile attacks, similarly, uh, there was, you know, the, and, the, and the, you know, the drone program really arose in answer to this question because Richard Clark and you know, began to, who was then the White House counterterrorism uh, bazaar, really began to push on the agency and also on DOD, the Pentagon, to uh, A, get a surveillance drone that worked up over Afghanistan and B, to arm it. Um, and in the summer of 2001, there was actually tests in, uh, at, at, <clears throat> at test sites in the deserts of uh, the West where the armed drone worked, but there was a dispute about who was going to pay for the drones and what happens if they crashed? And in the end, the shot was never taken until after 9 11. Uh, I, when bin Laden was killed, you eventually visited the, the compound in Pakistan. I'm curious about just hearing you describe in your, uh, your own words and what you sense and what it was like walking in there. Um, can you just describe that a little bit for us? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd been reporting on this guy for a long time when I visited the compound and I, I didn't know the Pakistanis would demolish it two weeks later. Um, I was the only outside observer they allowed in um, to, and I, they, I presume they knew they were gonna demolish it and somehow they wanted sort of an outside observer to, to, be in, to be there. And I requested this, I'd gone to Pakistan three times to try and get in. 
Um, and yeah, you walk, I walked in the, the front gate with a member of the Pakistani ISI in military intelligence service, was not allowed to take uh, video or photos. Um, there was an armed army captain uh, <laughs> with us, so it was not up for debate. Um, I could see the field where the US helicopter had taken the crash landing. You could see the kind of evidence of the crash landing, uh, like scorch marks on the wall. Uh, and then I, we turned left, there was a small building where one of the bodyguards and his wife were, and their kids were living. Um, there was evidence of a pretty violent firefight um, and a lot of broken glass. And then I walked into the courtyard uh, where there was a big three-story building where bin Laden lived. Now, interestingly, the CIA, one of the tells for the CIA is the, the compound, which was over you know, one acre, was in the name of one of the bodyguards. And yet the bodyguard was living in this tiny annex. And there was this mysterious other family who were living in the big three-story house. And so that was sort of an interesting kind of disconnect that made them think, hey, maybe that in this house is the bin Laden family. So I, I walked in and I could see the evidence of what had happened that I, you know, the, the, the seals went in. There was a, very interestingly, there was a giant yellow metal door on the ground floor that prevented you from getting up to the second and third floor where the Bin Laden family was living. Who puts a giant metal door in the ground floor of their house? I mean, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, but of course it makes sense if the Bin Laden's there. So we walked up and then I walked up into the bedroom where Bin Laden was killed. Um, and the ceiling was quite low, much lower say than the ceiling that, you, that you're in or I'm in. Uh, Bin Laden's six foot four, the ceiling must have like, he must have just kind of brushed the top of the ceiling with his head. You could see, dark spots on the ceiling, which I assumed to be the kind of where you know, Bin Laden was shot in the head and where sort of blood has spurted out of his head and was kind of congealing on the ceiling. There was just for man hair dye in that room. Bin Laden was kind of vain about his appearances in the media, particularly, uh, which he was using. I found he had a tiny little squat toilet on one side. Uh, he had across the, across the corridor, he had a study where he would you know, write these long memos and read books and he had a lot of time on his hands. And it allowed me to kind of put together in my own mind a better account of what happened the night of the raid, but also how were they living? And they were not living in any great luxury. Bin Laden always had been something of a miser. He wanted always to live in the very, there were no decorations. Each of his wives had a, their own kind of apartment with a crude, you know, stove. Um, but it was, you know, they were not living in any great luxury. Their beds were sort of almost bits of wood that were sort of, you know, hammered together. Mm -hmm. And the whole place seemed kind of run down and shot, shabby. Um, and those are some of my impressions. Mm -hmm. Well, I want, I have time for one more question. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask it myself. I wanna hold up the book and show folks the book because I think it's interesting, Peter, that the image that's on the cover of this book is uh, Osama bin Laden at 15, 12, something like that. Yeah. Um, and tell, tell, you know, was that a specific, was there a specific reason why that age uh, was selected as the image to put on the, the cover of the book? Yeah, that picture is a drawing um, and it's, uh, it's a kind of um, composite of two pictures that one that we know is bin laden and another that we believe is bin laden and i'm, I'm not an artist but uh it was the suggestion of my editor priscilla payton who is a uh, was a brilliant editor um and you know i think it, it helps raise the question how did that 14 year old kid become the man he became right uh, and it gets to this question of was any of this inevitable what were the off ramps and i think that's true of any any biography, including anybody who's watching this, you know, which is, we all know that the person when we are 14 is not the person that we are when we're much older. Absolutely. And many things intervene. Um, uh, and that I think is true for Bin Laden. And that I think is kind of the message. And you're, by the way, actually McGregor, you're the first person who's asked me that very good question. Because uh, I, I thought more people would be interested in that image. Um, it appears as an image of innocence if you look at it at first glance. And then when you know who it's about, you realize there's a long way to go in that book to go from that image to what you know happened. Indeed. Well, Peter, I think we're about out of time. Um, again, I want to just tell you thank you. This has been a real pleasure. Uh, and I hope the Colony Club members and others who joined us enjoyed it. 
Um, but I think we're going to conclude the program now. And just again, thank everyone. If you uh, if you're interested in a very quick read, that'll give you a lot of foundational information on how you can better interpret what's happening in Afghanistan and the world now. This is a really terrific book. So thanks again, Peter. I hope everyone has a great evening and look forward to visiting with you next time. Thank you, McGregor, and thank you, Dr. Sadov.